My name is Julian Knight and I'm an academic physician and geneticist based in Oxford and I'm co-hosting today with Alan Irvin, Professor of Dermatology from Trinity College, Dublin. The Association of Physicians aims to advance interdisciplinary translational medicine and one way we're doing this is through a series of webinars on emerging issues in medicine. Today our focus is to explore the challenges and opportunities in translating advances in genomic science into patient benefit. And this is particularly timely given the new NHS Genomic Medicine Service. And I'm really delighted to be joined by experts in the field who will each be giving a short presentation followed by a panel discussion based on questions that you, the audience, have already posed. And I would encourage you to write further questions into the chat function during the webinar. So our first speaker today is Professor Sir Mark Caulfield, Chief Scientist at Genomics England. Sir Mark has driven a remarkable period of transformational change in the implementation of whole genome sequencing into the NHS through his leadership at Genomics England together with outstanding contributions to cardiovascular genomics and translational cardiovascular research and pharmacology. So Mark, we look forward very much to your talk entitled The 100,000 Genomes Project Transforming the NHS. So good evening, everybody, and thank you, Julian, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to sketch for you how we arrived at a new National Genomic Medicine Service, with many thanks to the other speakers this evening, especially Claire Turnbull, who, as you see me, so should you see her. Um, so the 100,000 Genomes Project, as you know, was uh, incepted at the London 2012 Olympics in an unusual meeting of health ministers and scientists, where it was thought that the moment was right for a major whole genome transformation program and subsequent groups advised they should focus on rare disease and cancer. And so uh, we began to plan for this uh, and the program was based fundamentally on patient consent of individuals and family members in families with rare disease, cancer and with some infection. And uh, we began work in late 2013 to enroll a pilot and then made, move forward to the main program. To do that, we had patient consent undertaken by frontline NHS staff. And at the peak of the program, 5,000 frontline staff worked on this program through 13 genomic medicine centers in England that gave regional equity access across England. But also we negotiated for money to be made available from the MRC so Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales could join in. And the idea was that we would run uh, a clinical pipeline for whole genome sequencing uh, but also collect samples that could also add additional depth and benefit which we store. We established a sequencing centre at Hingston with Wellcome Trust support and that allowed us to sequence at high fidelity and we now have an ISO accredited pipeline for NHS sequencing and our bioinformatics pipelines also accredited that analyses the genomes and reports them back. And we store all this information in the Genomics England architecture which is 40 petabytes of space and that allows uh, people from the NHS, clinicians, healthcare professionals, and also researchers to look at the data in identified or de-identified form. And when we return a report to the NHS, it is a report on that patient, but the diagnosis is made in the NHS and they own what is returned to the patient, and that involves validation of the findings. Because this is still in its infancy relatively, or perhaps in its uh, early childhood, at least, that we assembled a coalition of academic researchers, over 3,500, that have formed the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Pipe Partnership. And they um, work on the data. They're from 33 countries and they've raised over 50 million in research funds. And then we have a discovery forum of industry partners and they also add value. So we've created this virtuous cycle where the researchers can continue to add value to the data and you see that they've had, got access on the right-hand side to very rich data. So all of this was about NHS transformation. So how have we taken that forward? Uh, we were with Claire and others here. Um, we began to work with Sue Hill and the NHS to transform the genomic medicine service in 2017 and 18. And what that meant was integrating a new laboratory system based on seven genomic lab hubs with regional equity across England. And we also developed a national test directory, which this meant uh, that my team and I 
reprofiled 300,000 tests and upgraded 25% to new technologies, bringing live in the NHS for the first time whole genome sequencing that can be ordered by you as clinicians watching this or health professionals against a, a targeted list of conditions in rare disease and cancer. And this whole genome sequencing will deliver 500,000 whole genomes over the next five years. And everybody will be offered the opportunity to consent for research through patient choice. And that means their data will become available to the UK knowledge base. Just very recently, the NHS also commissioned seven genomic medicine services alliances and these replace essentially the frontline interaction at the genomic medicines center level with the NHS, with clinicians and healthcare professionals. And there'll also be workforce development and education. So um, what this has led to is in 2021, the National Health Service for the first time has got a genomic medicine service that will provide consistent standardized and equitable care for 55 million people, 56 million people, I should more correctly say, operation, operating to common standards and protocols and ISO accredited for clinical care with a standardized national genomic consent for NHS care and research, delivering against an approved test directory, not a catalog or a guideline, but a directory and building a single UK knowledge base that will be available to researchers where patients give consent, but also available to the NHS to enable clinical care effectiveness and outcomes. And we have uh, an, a unique opportunity in the UK through Genome UK over the next 10 years to remain the world leader in genomic medicine. I should thank uh, the Association of Physicians for having me and these people and everybody who worked on the project. These people are the participants, they're the most important people in the programme. Thank you so much, Julian. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, beautiful start to our, our webinar today and there'll be opportunities um, to ask questions once we finish the, the series of short talks. So our, our next speaker is um, Claire Turnbull, um, Professor of Translational Cancer Genetics at the Institute of Cancer Research and Consultant in Clinical Cancer Genetics at the Royal Marsden NHS Foundation Trust. Professor Turnbull's research includes statistical population and public health related analyses of genetic cancer susceptibility and the implementation of expanded genomic testing. So Professor Turnbull, we look forward very much to your talk entitled Clinical Expansion of Cancer Susceptibility Genetics, Opportunities and Challenges. Okay, am I unmuted? You Lovely. Um, thank you very much for the invite, Julian. Um, so I'm going to do a quick whiz through, um, really focusing on using cancer susceptibility genetics for early detection and prevention of cancer, with the caveat that there are other applications in treatments of cancer, for example, PARP inhibitors, but I should be focusing on the former use case. Um, so the premise of early detection prevention of cancer is that there are some cancers that if we detect them early, they do better, outcomes are better, more people survive. And certainly we have national screening programs for breast, colorectal and cervix, um, whereby we scan the whole population with the aim of identifying cancers earlier. But if we can de detect those at higher a priori risk, we can offer them interventions that are not clinically acceptable or economically feasible to deliver at population level. So for example, we can screen them more often, we can screen them from a younger age, we can use different mod modalities, we can offer surgical prevention, chemo prevention, and targeted behavioral interventions. So how do we identify individuals at high risk of cancer? Well, of course, there are the non-genetic factors. Smoking is an obvious one. There are other, other um, more modest um, uh, environmental factors. And then, of course, the genetic factors. Um, so for any um, cancer type, you can sort of map the different types of genetic factors onto a schematic such as this. And this is the uh, genetic factors predisposing to breast cancer. So this is really where we've got to with all our research, identifying genetic factors predisposing to breast cancer. So there's really sort of two approaches. We can take these high penetrance ones um, and combined BRCA1 and 2 and PALB2, which are the sort of more common 
rare high penetrance genes. Um, if you uh, look in all comers with breast cancer, about three to four percent of women will have a pathogenic variant in one of these genes. If you look at population level, about half a percent of the population um, carry a high pe penetrance um, variant in one of these genes. Historically, because of low throughput testing, we really had to target our analysis on those with very extensive family histories, lots and lots of relatives with breast and ovarian cancer. Because the technology has improved, improved we can now offer testing um, uh, and reduce those thresholds. So, for example, I'm running a study offering testing using digital information giving to all comers with breast cancer. There are other studies looking at offering population testing, and that's probably where we need to think about going. And this is where I get to the sort of challenges um, around uh, um, uh, th that lie within the opportunities. It's around interpreting the data that we find. And despite these being two of the better characterized genes, there's still a lot of complexity about interpreting the data. So I, I would say simplistically, we need to think about interpretation on three levels. There's interpreting whether that variant is benign and pathogenic. Um, and those of you in this field who have tried to navigate the ACMG variant interpretation framework are aware that that is a postgraduate specialty in its own right. There is then thinking on a gene level. There is um, each gene has a different relationship with different cancer types. So you can see just for BRCA1 and 2, these different profiles of breast cancer risk and ovarian cancer risk and that age specific relationship. And then, of course, there is the um, level of risk reduction that different interventions afford. So in terms of interpreting and understanding how best to place and implement this um, uh, testing, you need to think on all three levels. And we have conveniently, since the beginning of time, pretended that all variants in a gene that are pathogenic have the same level of risk. And of course, they don't. Um, different variants all have their own individual level of risk. We have actually known this for BRCA1 and 2 for over 15 years, that um, despite seemingly truncating the protein, uh, protein trunking var truncating variants at either end of each gene have a higher risk of breast cancer, whilst those in the middle have a higher risk of ovarian cancer. And even on a simplistic um, level, if you think about BRCA1 and 2, as a group, the protein truncating variants have a higher risk than missense variants, but in other genes such as ATM and TP53, dominant negative effects mean that the missense variants have a higher risk than the truncating ones, albeit that all are pathogenic and disease associated. So that's sort of thinking about variant types. We then, of course, have the subtleties. Breast cancer isn't one disease. These genes have different risk of different types of breast cancer. So BRCA1, much higher risk of ER negative breast cancer, which, of course, has a much poorer prognosis. Uh, BRCA2, uh, more typical high risk of uh, ER positive breast cancers, which then leads to your interventions if you're thinking about how best to manage mutation carriers. Because, uh, for example, one of, um, one of our suite of interventions is chemo prophylaxis using anti-estrogen drugs. So, of course, they would reduce the risk of ER positive breast cancers, but not so much of ER negative. So I only touch the surface in the complexity of how to go forward. And I present you our two best characterized genes, arguably, in the whole genome. So just going back to this schematic, I've talked about these types of rarish high penetrance variants here. The other big question in cancer susceptibility genetics, and of course, ac across all of common complex disease, is um, using the common variants in the form grouped as polygenic risk scores. Um, and uh, in the exemplar of breast cancer, which is probably one of the poster children, is that the term? It's poster child for polygenic risk scores uh, because it's well studied. Um, and we have 313 SNPs in the best formulated polygenic risk score. And we also have a goodly handful of non-genetic factors. So these are our prediction curves. So the pale, the pale blue is using your non-genetic factors, how much that predicts. 
the green is using your 313 SNP polygenic risk score. And for breast cancer, um, breast density is also pretty predictive, independent um, of genetic contribution. So if you have a tripartite score using all three, this is the level of prediction you get. And this, um, in the best hands, this tripartite score has an area under the curve of round about uh, 68 to 70 percent. And as I say, uh, breast cancer is probably the poster child uh, for polygenic risk scores because it is so common, uh, because it has these uh, non-genetic factors, but also we've been good at finding the risk alleles. But most importantly, as well as being common, it's got, it's a reasonably serious disease. It has a reasonably high mortality. We understand the natural history and we have some things we can do about it. If we identify those at higher or lower risk, we can modify um, our allocation of these interventions. And I present for comparison, um, I've studied testicular cancer for many years and we have hit a home run on our GWAS. We have the best polygenic risk score of all cancers, uh, the most discriminatory, um, but uh, I say unfortunately, unfortunately in terms of implementation of that, fortunately in terms of the disease, this is, is an, a very rare cancer which is eminently treatable and has a fantastic prognosis. So therefore the clinical utility of implementing polygenic risk scores to stratify risk, when in fact we've never really bothered to develop screening for it, is highly questionable. So um, uh, Richard Halston, Amit Sud and myself, we um, sort of try to score all different cancers in regard of these criteria. Um, and of course, uh, um, just to go forward, the um, other cancer which is relatively common and has a reasonably predictable polygenic risk score is prostate cancer. But of course, this overall has a pretty low mortality the aggressive cases are relatively few, and it is one that classically we poorly understand the, bar, the natural history, as in we are, we are poor at predicting um, the, the foxes from, from the tortoises, um, and therefore discrimination of risk may only um, exacerbate issues of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So I will leave you with those thoughts around the challenges but the opportunities of using cancer susceptibility genetics to advance early detection and prevention. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed for, for setting the stage so nicely in terms of those challenges and, and some ways forward, which no doubt we'll return to. So it would be great if we can move on to our next speaker, uh, Deborah Gill, who's Professor of Gene Medicine at the University of Oxford and head of the Nuffield Division of Clinical Laboratory Sciences based at the John Radcliffe Hospital. Professor Gill is a translational scientist and a founding member of the UK Respiratory Gene Therapy Consortium uh, with a research focus on emerging gene technologies to treat lung diseases. So Professor Gill, we look forward very much to your talk, Gene Therapy, Success, Failure and Future. Thank you. Okay, so um, I thought I would just start by giving you a really broad overview of what um, gene therapy is and whether it's called gene medicine or gene editing. It's basically the same thing, which is the delivery of genetic material into the cell uh, for treatment uh, using a vector. And um, there are um, essentially two ways that you can do that. You can either use a synthetic uh, approach where you put the uh, genetic material inside the lipid um, and this is a bit like uh, to protect it basically and this is a bit like mixing a, a salad dressing. You mix your oil and vinegar, you shake it up and you get lots of uh, lipid based particles, little droplets which then can dissolve into the cell if you're delivering uh, DNA or RNA. And if you've received the Pfizer vaccine for COVID-19 you've already received essentially synthetic gene therapy. And if you've received the AstraZeneca then you've uh, vaccine for COVID-19 you've received viral gene therapy, because it's just the same thing. You put a piece of genetic material into a modified virus, and then you use that virus to deliver its genetic cargo into the cell. Now, whether you use, um, whichever vector you use, the selection is absolutely key to success. Um, uh, and whether you use the synthetic vector or the, uh, these three viruses here, AAV, uh, adenovirus uh, and lentivirus, um, and what you can, what, what's beneficial about using the viruses is that you essentially uh, can exploit the millions of years of evolution that these viruses have used to specifically target uh, these cells. 
And this efficient delivery that you, uh, that you once you found out how a, a particular virus can target uh, a particular organ, then uh, benefit from one disease, development of the technology in one disease can benefit uh, the diseases of other um, uh, diseases in that organ. And this is a platform technology. So this is the way that gene therapy tends to work. It focuses on the delivery and the technology uh, to make that gene therapy a success. So in terms of um, successes and failures for gene therapy, um, I think we have to focus, for example, on uh, AAV or adeno-associated virus. And this is uh, extremely useful because it has multiple serotypes that target different organs. And if you can get your um, specific serotype right, then you can target a range of, um, of different organs for treatment of disease. So for example, uh, AAV1 targets the muscle. And um, this was an example of a success in 2012 when the first gene therapy ever was approved for clinical use. Uh, in this particular case for lipoprotein lipase deficiency, which is a problem metabolizing fat. Um, unfortunately, it ended up as a market failure. It was withdrawn from the market a few years later, probably due to the fact that it was overpriced and um, targeted for too few uh, people. So that's, that was a real lesson for everybody uh, in how important it is to get this right. Um, if you use another AAV, you can target the liver, and in particular there's been successes for the treatment of haemophilia A. A single intravenous dose eliminates routine injections of factor VIII, and these patients have been uh, surviving um, well without these routine injections for um, you know, up to 10 years, I believe. You can have an AAV to uh, deliver to the eye for uh, treatment of blindness. Uh, various diseases, not all of them, but a single injection can halt or reverse the progressive loss of vision. So again, this is a huge success for those particularly young adults who are um, essentially have deteriorating vision and um, become legally blind eventually. And you can have an AAV for motor neurons, so you can deliver genetic material to these uh, to motor neurons to treat neuromuscular disorders. So um, in particular, most recently, SMA has been licensed for use in the UK for treatment in children under two, and it's absolutely essential for them because they progressively undergo this neuromuscular deterioration um, very quickly. So that's AAV and, there's a, um, and there's, so it's, it's, it's been particularly successful in the clinic. Lentivirus on the other hand um, is, uh, has been so far um, mainly confined to ex vivo delivery. So this is where you deliver your virus to the cells outside the body. So for example, the bone marrow or T cells. And um, the advantage of the uh, lentivirus is that it integrates into the cell genome. So what that means is that you can, uh, you can see the effects of this persist for a long time in the dividing cell populations. And so um, in terms of the bone marrow, where there are treatments where um, there is no matched donor, for example, or conventional treatments have failed, um, uh, lentivirus bone marrow um, uh, gene transfer has been used to treat a number of primary immune deficiencies uh, shown here and very successfully. Um, you can do the same thing in T cells for the ex vivo delivery of CAR T cell therapy and again that's been approved in this country for the treatment of uh, certain leukemias. Again in patients uh, under 24 years so and usually in patients where conventional treatments have already been attempted and have um, and been unsuccessful. So all of these are examples of clinical um, successes for gene therapy. Now, in terms of um, gene therapy to the lungs, in particular for cystic fibrosis, this is a field that I've been involved with for many years. And I have to say that this has not been successful. It's been extremely challenging. Despite the gene for cystic fibrosis being discovered in 1989, there is still no clinical gene therapy available. And uh, we've had some moderate success. We've shown proof of principle for um, delivery of a synthetic version of a gene therapy uh, vector, um, but it was too inefficient. It showed some uh, modest kind of um, uh, benefit, but we couldn't take it forward. And so what's happening now is that we're switching vectors. We're going to use um, a lentivirus, which is specifically targeted for um, efficient delivery to the lungs. Uh, and this is to be tested in the clinic. And of course, once we uh, manage to um, achieve an efficient delivery to the lungs for CF, we can use that for treatment of, of other rare diseases. Uh, particularly, we're interested in developing it for surfactant deficiencies for which there are no treatments. So uh, what does that leave us in terms of the future of gene therapy? Um, I'll give you some examples of successes. Where that goes next is going to be dependent on a multiple uh, factors. The first set of factors are essentially based on cost, I think. Um, 
uh, it, we, what we need is pharmaceutical and biotech company interest uh, to drive investment in this new technology. And I have to say at the moment, this is very high. This is probably the highest it's been as we, on the back of all of these um, successful clinical therapies, um, uh, investment interest is really um, uh, going great guns at the moment. Of course, we have to manage expectations. So we don't want uh, unnecessary hype and false hope for patients because uh, this doesn't do anybody any good and ends up with a lot of disappointed people. The cost of treatment is really, really high and we're going to have to come up with some really creative reimbursement models which are going to fit the particular healthcare model of the country that we, we, we live in and a lot of negotiation needs to be done in order to, um, to manage that. Uh, and that's why it's, I think it's only ever going to be appropriate for either extremely rare diseases or diseases where conventional treatments have already failed in those diseases. The cost of, of treatment is um, in one respect driven by the cost of manufacturing. And I think that the cost of goods is likely to fall because um, of the investment that we've seen in large scale vaccine production for COVID-19. So um, these um, uh, large scale bioreactors here on the right, uh, these are designed to essentially make vaccine, uh, virus for vaccine. And uh, they're exactly the same as the ones that you need for making virus for gene therapy. So this investment actually should drive down the cost of manufacturing. The other collection of factors which predict where we go next with gene therapy is of course about the benefit to patients. And um, as I've mentioned, we have to be really selective, really judicious choice of diseases for um, those which will be uh, useful for gene therapy and can benefit from gene therapy because they have no other suitable treatments. Um, but we, even within a disease, there is a patient selection needs to be judicious for the identification of severe disease mutations. So again, those mutations with no suitable treatment. So an example of that is from the field of uh, cystic fibrosis, where over the last decade, some really um, uh, incredible drugs have now been developed for a large number of the mutations uh, seen in cystic fibrosis, of which there are some 2000. Um, and the majority of those uh, mutations can be treated with small molecule drugs, which act on residual protein left over. And this mutant protein uh, can be acted upon by these small molecules and they can actually now function enough to benefit the patient. But there are some who have uh, uh, severe disease mutations that don't produce any residual protein. And so these treatments won't work for them and therefore they will need gene therapy. And of course, all of this relies on the need for really um, expert and strong infrastructure for genetic screening, particularly newborn screening for these um, degenerative illnesses in childhood. And of course, this requires early diagnosis and uh, you know, so we can treat them before there is disease progression. So I guess on that uh, note, what we have here is essentially a cost versus benefit analysis for the future. Uh, so I guess in the end, unfortunately, it's all down to economics. So um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That's great, Deborah. Thank you so much. I think you're leaving us with a, a glass hopeful, half full, hopefully, um, and look forward to going back to those issues in the discussion. So our final um, short talk um, for the webinar is from Nina Hallowell, Professor of Social and Ethical Aspects of Genomics in the Nuffield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford. And for over 25 years, she's been undertaking research on healthcare professionals, patients, and family members' views um, regarding genetic testing, mainly in the field of cancer. She's recently completed a project on mainstreaming BRCA testing in the UK, and we look forward very much to your talk, uh, Social and Ethical Aspects of Genomics. Thank you very much, Gillian, and thank you for inviting me to talk tonight. I want to open by considering the concept of technical sweetness. In case you're unfamiliar with this term, it is basically the recognition that sometimes when you have a technically sweet solution to a previously intractable problem, you go ahead and solve the problem without asking questions such as what will be the consequence of doing this or whether you should go down that road. As this slide indicates here, Oppenheimer used this concept to reflect on his part in building the atomic bomb, and others have used it to discuss Dr. Frankenstein's dilemma. He dis discovered a way to reanimate flesh, but got so carried away with this idea that he forgot to ask himself whether it was good. Now, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, but genomic sequencing can be seen as a technically sweet solution to what could be thought of 
of as a set of wicked problems in medicine, finding an etiological explanation for disease, determining diagnosis, choosing a treatment or predicting risks of future disease. But while genomics may enable us to solve some of these problems, in some cases the solutions are not always straightforward, because like to all technically sweet solutions, the implementation of genetics and genomics in healthcare raises a number of issues. First, I want to point out that fantastic as this technology may be in answering some of the questions I've just listed, the hype often performs the outperforms the technology. So while we can use genomic technologies to identify disease or suggest treatments, quite often the results of testing are not easily interpretable or implementable. For example, as Claire's pointed out, sequencing may provide a result that is unclear or uncertain in terms of what impact the observed genetic variant has on the phenotype, whether it is pathogenic or benign. These variants of uncertain significance or thus instead of providing answers, raise further questions about what we can or should do for a particular patient in the face of this uncertainty. Do we use risk reducing measures just in case, or do we wait and see if more evidence about the nature of the variant in question comes to light? The other general issue I want to raise is the issue of biased ascertainment in genetics and genomics research and what this means for the clinic. What do I mean? Well, very crudely, much of the research to date has involved participants of European ancestry, which means that many pathogenic variants identified may be population specific. We don't know how to categorize these variants in other populations. In other words, some tests may only make reliable predictions for people with a particular ancestry. So now to some of the ethical issues that may arise within the clinic. You have a patient in front of you who has breast cancer or cardiac problems, plus a family history of disease, and you know genetic testing is available. What are some of the issues to think about when you offer them a test? or even discuss when making a referral to clinical genetics. First, you may need to think about what type of test is being offered. If you're ordering a gene panel test, a test that looks at a number of genes at the same time, or maybe exome or genome sequencing, which looks at large parts of the genome. Both of these types of tests may generate extra results incidental or additional findings. Findings that are not the focus of the original inquiry, but are also identified by testing. And these may have impl implications for the patient and their family's health. These could be genes for different inherited diseases, such as a carrier status for a recessive disease, genes for other cancers, or maybe SNPs that increase the risk of common diseases. What should you do about this? Should you include information about the possibility of the test generating extra findings when you take consent or offer it? Should you give people the option to receive these findings or not? But if so, this then leaves you with a question of what should you do if they say they do not want them and you end up with clinically relevant information about your patient and their family that they say they do not want. Next, what should you do about future findings? It is possible that the test you've used identified a variant of uncertain significance in the patient. In other words, we don't know what the variant's role is in the patient's disease. This variant could be reinterpreted in the future, giving us more information. And then we may be able to confirm that having this variant significant the increase their disease risks, or alternatively, we might establish at this point it's benign and was not a causal factor in the patient's disease. Should we warn them that although we are uncertain now about the result we've just got, we may come back to them in the future and update them with new information? And if you think the answer to that is yes, then what happens if they say no, they don't want any information? And then five years down the line, you receive information about them and their family's risks. What will you do with this? What happens if the patient has deceased, but the family members may benefit from this information? Plus, how do we pay for reinterpretation, recontacting, and who is going to organise it? 
This is clearly a resource issue. Finally, while you have one patient in front of you, if their cancer or heart disease is in an inherited form, then this may have implications for family members. Not least, they may need a predictive test to determine their risks. How do you explain this to your patient? And what should you do if they refuse to relay this information to their relatives? All of these ethical dilemmas can be ameliorated somewhat by better communication about an understanding of genetics and genomics, but this is also an issue. Recent research in the US, UK and Russia, I know a strange combination of countries, suggests that public's general understanding of genetics and genomics is relatively poor, which suggests Therefore, it is down to clinicians to enable greater public understanding during consultations. Now that's okay if you're a geneticist or a genetic counsellor, but what if you're not? There is a large amount of research suggesting that non-specialist knowledge of genetics is poor and that they lack confidence in explaining testing and risks and their implications to their patients. Indeed, our re recent research found that mainstream healthcare professionals, in this case, breast surgeons and general and gynecological oncologists, were not uniformly positive about the prospect of offering BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic testing to their cancer patients in order to personalise treatment options. There was a big divide here in our study, with oncologists in general happy to offer genetic testing to their patients following some genetics education as they felt able to explain complex probabilities and prognoses. Surgeons, on the other hand, felt they not only lacked genetics knowledge, but also the communication skills and more importantly, the time. As far as they were concerned, offering cancer patients treatment focused genetic testing is someone else's job. So if we're to mainstream genetic testing, there are a couple of basic things we need to do. We need to plug the knowledge gaps within the public and medical profession. We need genomics education in schools, in MOOCs. We need more CPD in genomics and risk communication. We need to engage and communicate with not only non-expert members of the public, but also across the medical specialties. Our research on the mainstreaming of BRCA testing revealed that not only were breast surgeons resistant to mainstreaming, but they had really very little idea of what they were being asked to do. And one reason for this was a lack of communication and engagement with their genetics department, despite the fact that they frequently referred their patients onto them. So basically what we need here is more communication across the specialties and perhaps recruit individuals to champion genetics and genomics within mainstream medicine and society more generally. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nino. Um, I think you've, you've very nicely set the stage for the real world implementation and the in the implications of, of what we're, we're proposing to do with, with genomic knowledge. So I would encourage everyone in the audience to use the chat to pose questions. Um, and thank you to those that have already done so prior to the event. And perhaps um, myself and my co-moderator, Alan Irvin, will, will ultimately pose the questions to the panel. And we could start with um, polygenic risk scores. And a, and a question that's come in, which perhaps has got underlined in it, the real potential of polygenic risk scores in disease prevention. And it'd be great, Claire, if you could perhaps um, talk us through how you see real world implementation here and um, the benefits that can be accrued in an NHS setting. So, yeah, I mean, polygenic risk scores are it's a complex issue, um, but essentially, um, firstly, it depends on how heritable a condition is. And secondly, therefore, how much of that heritability you can actually identify the um, common variant basis for. But even if you could identify all the SNPs underpinning the heritability of many conditions, your polygenic risk score is still normally distributed. So most people will sit within one or two standard deviations of the mean. So you give them their polygenic risk score and their risk doesn't shift that much from the risk with which they walk through the door. 
But if you take sort of successes, like Crohn's disease is one for which polygenic risk, you know, there's been good discovery, um, lots of SNPs found, it's a well-characterized phenotype. And those in the top 1% of risk are at about a three to 3.5 fold risk compared to the general population. And the population risk is around about one in 200. So you're still only elevating the risk for those people up to something in the region of one in 60. So I think that iterates what I was saying about breast cancer, that it's really these only start offering a, a useful tool if your starting risk is pretty high. So breast cancer, if you have a starting risk of 12 percent, again, those in the top, it's a bit, those in the top sort of 1.3 percent have uh, roughly threefold risk or a risk that's over 30 percent, which is what we clinically would um, advocate preventative mastectomy based on. So you can slice out the top 1%, and that's for breast cancer, which is a very common phenotype, and do something relatively useful with them. With regard to the remainder, there's lots of modeling um, and um, sort of uh, analyses that suggest that essentially because breast cancer screening, there is such a substantial rate of overdiagnosis that actually you could use your tripartite score to take out round about the bottom 30 to 40 percent of risk and have you'd essentially still be neutral in terms of the pickup of breast cancer that is going to cause so the survival impact on breast cancer and um, the, the health economic tipping point um, but actually then trying to take breast screening away from the bottom 30 to 40 percent of the population who will still develop an appreciable rate of breast cancers is is a tricky challenge so i i i think we need to temper our excitement that polygenic risk scores are the answer most common most common complex conditions are, are arguably too infrequent to have impact we also have, you don't shift very risk very much in that many people. And uh, most conditions aren't that heritable. So even if you could find all the SNPs, it's not going to have that much difference. And also, as I said before, you, you have to have something to offer those in whom you have either shown them to be at high risk or at low risk. Um, so the application in, in cases um, where, where, we, where we don't, you know, we have no evidence that early early pickup or pre-symptomatic pickup, but there's anything we can do. So I guess the ones that are still in the offing, breast cancer, arguably to reduce screening um, and potentially um, uh, hypercholesterolemia, so non-monogenic hypercholesterolemia, are, are probably the sort of two candidates um, uh, or that linked to ischemic heart disease were, were sufficiently common and, and we do have we, we have an armory of tools at our disposal. Um, I guess the other separate issue is around understanding uh, mechanisms of disease with the potential for drug discovery. So that's that is a, a different consideration. But in terms of risk stratification, I think uh, these are aside from all the many problems about which Nina could speak at great length around implementation challenges, communication challenges, the fact that we don't have polygenic risk scores that work outside of Western Europeans, uh, communicating to patients, the you know, new, nuanced graded risk and so forth. But, but even if you set all those um, issues aside, I, th I think the impact for um, substantial impact on health prevention is challenging. Thank you. Would anybody from the panel like to, to further comment on that? Um, yes, I'd just like to, to echo what Claire's just said. I think uh, the thing she left out was actually persuading the people who have increased polygenic risk scores to take up some of the things that may be on offer. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of research in the past on sort of genetic impacts on health and, and people just don't change their behavior basically. So I think it depends very much what you're actually offering to people and whether they found that acceptable. Absolutely. Alan, did you want to come in with a question? Yes, I'd, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. Those are really engaging um, and brief and fantastic talks. 
I have a question which I think probably best to address to Nina. And this one is from a pre-submitted question from one of the attendees. And it really speaks to what you were talking uh, about with regards to genomic literacy and the fact that many people trained a long time ago when this wasn't part of the curriculum and now they're uh, in, the, in the clinic. And this question is posed as should, should patients who have genetic testing uh, see a genetic counsellor first? And I might just add a slight add on to that and to say should physicians requesting um, genomic testing also have some minimum of training or familiarity before they order uh, those tests. So Nina, your thoughts would be welcome. Thank you. Um, yes. Well, I, I do know that actually that there is a whole new way of training genetic counselors these days to take into account genomic sequencing. And also um, there is uh, on the project that Claire is running, Kanjin Kanvar, there is a whole heap of education and training for people who are involved in, in genomics at this moment in time. So yes, um, I think when we did our project on mainstreaming, which was, uh, as Claire said, sort of on the poster child of genetic testing, um, it was very clear that what really worried a lot of the clinicians that we were talking to um, was um, their lack of knowledge. Their lack of knowledge about genetics and genomics, and it, this was a, a particularly easy um, test in in that sense to offer people um, so there was a lack of knowledge about that but but more importantly a lack of knowledge about explaining risk to people so I think that's why we got a very big difference between asking breast surgeons to mainstream genetic testing versus oncologists because oncologists are very used to explaining complex risk and complex prognosis maybe Claire's would have something to add to this as well because I know that um, with regard to Kanji and Kampar, Claire. Yeah so I, I think there are, there are two um, if, if you know the specific population that you're offering the test to and you know the tests that you're offering and it's a sort of clear-cut package of information I would argue that we can sometimes be a bit overly cautious and protectionist um, and actually arguably the tests are pretty cheap now what it sort of uh, remains expensive is is providing a dense infrastructure of genetic counseling and communication and pathways and processes so we have a study uh, we're randomizing pay, uh, all comers with breast cancer they'll all have a BRCA1 to PALB2 test and half of them are randomized to getting their pre-test information digitally with recourse to a national genetic counselor hotline should they want it. And the other half have um, standard of care, which is a one-to-one -one consultation. So I'd argue we've defined who we're testing. We know what we're testing them for and actually really nicely, beautifully presented standardized digital information they can look at in their own home is a good thing. At the other end of the spectrum, the way in which you interpret a test is a test result is predicated on the context in which the test was performed and the level of phenotype and so forth. And that um, speaks to the national test directory that, that Mark described, that we really don't want to, we want to be very cautious about offering whole genome sequencing and those types of tests and what we analyze them in we, we want to make sure we're offering it in the context of knowing the phenotype and the patient group to whom we're offering it, because that will very much drive how you interpret the data. And a whole genome will give you five million um, variants per patient that differ from uh, the reference genome. And how you interpret that and the information you give back to the patient it, it is very much influenced on, on knowing what the clinical features are. So. I, I think that that's where we need to try and balance um, really expanding access to genetic testing in specific groups and specific contexts where we know what we're doing with the results and we, we, we can define clear pathways and, and use innovative methods to expand access, but also have a level of caution in not um, sort of expanding genetic testing willy-nilly because we will start getting results and giving back information and doing things to patients and chopping bits of them off and screening them which can do harm where actually the interpretation of the genetic results has been um, erroneous in the context of phenotype. 
Claire, just on on the on the question of training, because we're we're an association that has people who are mm. largely academic clinicians from wide ranges of backgrounds. The, um, Nina mentioned the MOOCs model. Is there a is there a model for um, you know postgraduate certificate or something like that through the Royal College of Physicians where people who want to become more skilled at in this space but who feel that they need something a little bit more structured? Is there a role for that from the genomics community just to to bring people, if you like, up to 2021 and where things sit? Um, well, th there was a, a large amount of funding via Health Education England. So they, they've developed um, uh, at, at the sort of upper end of which was a, a master's in genomic medicine, which was um, undertaken over the last five or so years by various um, NHS um, uh, staff of different grades and, and different specialties. Um, and then there are also elements of that um, available for uh, as chunks for CPD. Um, as Nina said, um, uh, working with Health Education England, the education team at George's, they have a specialist unit in genomic education. So that's led by Kate Tatton Brown. So she, they develop lots of MOOCs. So that's a massive open online course. And that's very um, student led. And you do you have little chunks each week which add up to getting a certificate at the end. Um, uh, and they also run a PG cert. So I think they're, they're definitely different levels. Um, it's tricky, I think, for any clinician because many clinicians will only see cases to whom genetics is relevant quite infrequently. And it's that sort of, if you don't use it, you lose it. So trying to develop resources. So again, the Georges team are developing sort of suites of um, uh, I think they call them sort of as and when resources so that you can reach them when you've just seen a patient or you're just about to see a patient and try and make those types of sort of um, immediate resources accessible and, and so that clinicians and particularly people in primary care know where they are, which may be a better model than um, something where you sort of really train up at one point. So there is lots of focus um and and lots of um uh, resources being developed as ever it's it's ensuring that people know how to get to them at the right time thank you Claire. thank you for that julian back to you thank you um so i think we've mentioned a couple of times or several times about mainstreaming and um claire you were just talking about primary care right at the end there and i wonder if i could pose a question um from those registered at the meeting to Samark, and this is about where we see genomics being integrated into primary care in the next 10 years, because this is going to be hugely important uh, if we're going to truly achieve that mainstreaming. Thank you, Julian. Um, so uh, at Genomics England, we've established a primary care committee and are interacting with the Association of Medical Royal Colleges, Genomic Champions Group, uh, to plan how we would do this with NHS England. So one key area where this immediately has a potential to uh, appear in primary care is at the main point of prescribing in relation to pharmacogenomics. And there's a question, when do we think pharmacogenomics will enter? Well, um, actually what we've asked the GP group that are work, working with us to do is to look at how we could produce effective decision support manageable within a reasonable consult time that would um, actually enable this to be utilized as a, a precursor for adoption. Um, there are plans afoot and an NHS working group on this to define the pharmacogenomics, but that's probably where uh, the point of prescribing, where this information will most impact. And if you listen to GPs, Julian, you'll know that they, as you do, you'll know they don't um, really need any more flags in their uh, GP uh, EHR systems to alert them to do things because they're getting the flags all the time. What they need is something that's, that actually helps them decide what to do in a rapid fire. The other area where I think there is benefits in general practice is in decision support around rare disease because rare diseases by definition affect small numbers of the population, although collectively they affect one in 17 of us in the UK. And the really challenging thing is if you've never seen this rare disease before, is how do you know what to do and how do you identify that? We can see people in the 100,000 Genomes Project who went you know, 13, 14 times uh, before they actually got referred 
um, to the hospital. So it, 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 it is, this is a problem. And that's the other area where decision support would really help general practice. And we're committed to trying to develop those tools because in general practice has such a little time to manage an individual consult. So it's really important we get that right. And I probably should say, because I forgot to say it earlier, that everybody in rare disease had unmet diagnostic need in the program and they got about a 20% overall diagnostic uplift. But if whether you're prior or, or no testing before, you get a substantial uplift in data that we've generated recently over usual care testing in the NHS. So um, whole genomes is not a panacea, as Claire says, she's quite right there, but there's a mixed economy for future testing. and We've got to enable general practice to handle this, but also mainstream this in the NHS in hospitals. Thank you very much indeed. Alan. Yeah, so I think we've time just really for, for one uh, more question. You, uh, Mark has already dealt with some of the, the issues about affordability and about pharmacogenomics in, in, um, in a little bit of detail. There's more of a niche question here, and that's what impact, if any, will genomic advances make in the treatment of lymphomas? So perhaps, Claire, that might be one for you. Um. So there's, I mean, I guess I've spoken using constitutional germline genetics for identifying those at elevated risk. Um, so that's really with a focus on early detection and prevention. The other area is, of course, studying the tumour um, and the acquired somatic mutations um, and uh, using those to understand the series of changes that have led to oncogenesis. Um, and um, uh, then obviously over the last 20 years, there's been great progress in developing targeted drugs, which um, subvert what, whatever the, the derailed process that a mutation um, identifiable in the tumor represents um, and target that pathway. Um, they uh, has been substantial successes, particularly for example, in uh, melanoma, in lung cancer, um, and it is an ongoing race in that regard uh, because tumour is inherently di Darwinian. So they uh, develop resistance mutations. So looking at multidrug therapy and then sort of in the, in the uh, sort of other lane of the motorway, the advancement of immunotherapy. Um, so I think lymphoma is an example where these various approaches have been um, explored. Um, CAR-T, also an, another example of leveraging um, and augmenting the immune system using molecular mechanisms that have become possible through advances in, in genomics. Um, uh, so again, I think all of these approaches um, utilized uh, to try and improve outcomes in lymphoma. Um, but in all these regards, management of cancer and particularly advanced cancer is invariably balancing the sort of Darwinian nature of cancer to evade whatever you throw at it um, and also that balance of toxicity in terms of um, uh, sort of being limited ab about the level of drug to which you can expose the host whilst trying to treat the tumour. Thank you Claire. That's great, we're, I think we're just about out of time but um, it just remains for me to thank all of our speakers for brilliant talks, keeping so wonderfully to time and a very stimulating discussion and to encourage everyone that's logged in today uh, to join us in the next webinar on emerging issues in medicine. So thanks to everyone. Thank you very much.